It's July 2008, the height of the financial crisis, and Steve Cohen's right-hand man, Matthew Martoma, organizes a secret meeting with a key figure in the world of medicine. As Martoma gazes upon PowerPoint slides marked confidential, do not distribute, he unravels the fate of a groundbreaking Alzheimer's drug. That moment, Steve Cohen made a decision that set millions at stake. Little did he know that the action set in motion during the pivotal meeting will become the linchpin in a seven-year saga. The relentless pursuit by federal authorities started to dismantle SAC Capital, the empire Cohen built with an almost mythical touch. Steve Cohen is the legend on Wall Street. He's amassed one of the great Americans were amazing in everybody. How does anybody make 60% a year? Well, the feds are asking that. They told me they were going to arrest everybody. trading at Stevie Cohen's SAC Capital. You are. Rules are rules, and the law is the law. I understand the rules on trading and inside information. It's very vague. Steve Cohen, the man who seemed to possess an uncanny ability to predict the unpredictable, danced on the edge of financial storms and emerged unscathed. But behind the opulence of his 35,000 square foot mansion and the whispers of his prowess as the ultimate predator of the market, a shadow loomed, the looming specter of insider trading. Steve Cohen's story begins in the late 1950s. Born on July 11, 1956, Steve grew up in a middle-class Jewish family in Great Neck, New York. His father, a dress manufacturer in Manhattan's Garment District, and his mother, a piano teacher, instilled in him values that would later shape his character. Steve was the third of seven siblings, navigating the intricacies of a bustling household while developing a unique fascination with risk from an early age. Growing up in the tight-knit community of Great Neck, Cohen's childhood was marked by the regular hustle and bustle of a typical American family. The turning point, however, came during his high school years in the early 70s. Great Neck's North High School witnessed the emergence of young Cohen who, fueled by a penchant for risk-taking, found an unexpected passion in poker. High school tournaments became his battleground, and with a wallet full of his own money, he began honing his skills that would later become invaluable in the world of finance. Despite the outwardly ordinary nature of his childhood, the underlying struggles were palpable. His father's work in the garment district instilled in Cohen a strong work ethic. But the financial struggles faced by the family were the silent backdrop to his formative years. These struggles, rather than acting as deterrents, became the catalysts for Steve's resilience and determination to rise above his circumstances. While still in college, Cohen took a job at the less known brokerage firm Gruntel, where he started developing his skills in arbitrage. Gruntel, situated close to Wall Street, was an unconventional environment that attracted misfits and provided Cohen the opportunity to hone his trading instincts. Upon graduation from John L. Miller Great Neck North High School in 1978, Cohen faced a pivotal moment. Armed with the economics degree from Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, he stood at the precipice of the corporate world. The journey, however, was not without its hurdles. In a leap of faith, a friend helped him open a brokerage account with $1,000 of his hard-earned tuition money. This marked the embryonic stage of Cohen's foray into the financial realm. Two years after his graduation, Steve Foley went on day trading as he saw an opportunity laying ahead. Skills like self-discipline, patience, money management, strategic thinking, mathematics, and emotion control that are very hard needed in the world of trading. But even using these skills in his trading choices, it didn't go smoothly at all. In his first two years of daily trading, he had several setbacks and lost tens of thousands of dollars. But by learning and keeping his head in the game, from 1982, it went upwards. He started to take his first major wins, and by 1984, he made his first million through day trading. Cohen's financial acumen became evident during his tenure at the trading firm Gruntel, where, in his early 20s, he earned 5 to 10 million annually in commissions. His instincts and quick decision making set him apart, laying the foundation for what would become a remarkable career. The success Cohen enjoyed faced a significant challenge with the 1987 stock market crash, 
where the U.S. markets fell by 20% in a single day. Gruntle, like many other firms, was practically put out of business. Despite this setback, Cohen actively traded through the chaos, demonstrating resilience and survival instincts. The crash marked a turning point in his career, prompting a desire to move away from Gruntle and start his own venture. In 1993, Cohen founded SAC Capital with around $23 million in capital and nine employees, including $10 million of his own money. His trading strategy, characterized by making predictions around events such as takeovers and IPOs, proved immensely successful during the 1980s, a period dominated by mergers and acquisitions in the American stock market. At that time, the concept of a hedge fund was relatively unknown, but Cohen's approach was different. Unlike traditional long-term investments, SAC focused on quick trades, reacting quickly to market events. Cohen's strategy, contrary to Warren Buffett's, involved both buying long and betting against short stocks, creating a hedge against market fluctuations. His exceptional success was not only due to market prowess, but also an exorbitant 50% performance fee, highlighting SAC's extraordinary profitability. In this environment, Cohen's hedge fund stood out. This is because of one notable case involving SAC trader Matthew Martoma. Martoma's base salary was meager compared to the millions in bonuses he could earn, but his trades proved successful. His focus centered on two medical companies, a land corporation and wife, testing a groundbreaking Alzheimer drug called Bepinezumab. To gain an edge, Martoma sought insider information and connected with Dr. Sidney Gilman, chair of the Safety Monitoring Committee for the drug's clinical trials. Dr. Gilman, initially cautious, gradually shared confidential details about the drug's progress. Martoma, confident in the drug's success, convinced Cohen to build massive positions in Alan and Wythe securities totaling $700 million. As the 2008 financial crisis gripped the world, Martoma's elaborate plan neared its climax. Dr. Gilman was set to present the drug's trial results, and Martoma, aware of the impending disappointment, orchestrated a swift sell-off. SAC Capital liquidated its entire equity position in a land and wife, avoiding losses and pocketing profits of $275 million. But the intricacies of the scheme came to light when a trader at RBC Capital Markets noticed unusual activity and reported it. The FBI, already unraveling the web of insider trading within the hedge fund industry, targeted SAC and ultimately Steve Cohen. The pursuit of Cohen by the FBI faced numerous challenges. A pivotal moment involved SAC analyst John Horvath's tip about Dell's disappointing earnings which reached Cohen through various channels. However, Cohen's defense argued that he received thousands of emails daily, making it improbable that he even saw the specific email in question. The case against Cohen suffered a setback when portfolio manager Michael Steinberg, found guilty of insider trading, refused to cooperate. The FBI's frustration mounted as they realized the operational structure of SAC resembled a bicycle wheel, with Cohen at the hub. The spokes represented portfolio managers and their teams, making it challenging to directly implicate Cohen. Despite guilty pleas and convictions within SAC, the elusive Cohen remained beyond the authorities' reach. Cohen's legal battles kicked off with intense dispositions. Presumably, David Obermeyer passionately defended his client's constitutional rights. The legal clash centered on Cohen's refusal to produce documents citing his Fifth Amendment right the shield protecting individuals from self-incrimination. This legal dance wasn't trivial. It was a calculated maneuvering between the sex staff attorney and Cohen's defense, both vying for strategic advantage. During the dispositions, the sex staff attorney aimed to compel Cohen to personally invoke his Fifth Amendment right. However, Obermeyer skillfully deflected, asserting that he spoke on Cohen's behalf. This nuanced but crucial exchange underscored the tension in legal strategies, revealing the intent to take the fifth could imply guilt, despite being a constitutionally protected right. 
as a legal drama played out, key players, including Prosecutor Zabel, scrutinized the defense's arguments. The narrative of Cohen as a hands-off investor seemed weak. The insider trading investigation consumed considerable time and resources, diverting attention from other financial fraud cases. The stakes were high, with Cohen's potential indictment promising a historic Wall Street prosecution. In a strategic move, Barrera and his team opted to take action against SAC Capital Advisors instead of personally indicting Cohen. This decision, though not ideal, was deemed a respectable fallback. Barrera unveiled charges against SAC, alleging insider trading, wire fraud, and civil money laundering. Yet the absence of charges against Cohen himself became a media focal point, leaving his reputation hanging in the balance. Five former employees have admitted to insider trading at SAC. At a press conference today, U.S. Attorney Preet Bharara said it was a magnet for market cheaters with rampant insider trading. In the aftermath, Cohen retreated to his East Hampton home, warning his daughters about potential negative publicity. Despite allegations against his company, Cohen maintained his innocence. Throughout the following summer, he defiantly returned to his trading desk, conducting business as usual even as major investment banks continued working with him. The paradox of labeling SAC a magnet for market cheaters while maintaining business relationships underscored the complexities of Wall Street connections. The shadow of insider trading cast a dark cloud over SAC Capital. In 2014, one of SAC's portfolio managers, Matthew Martoma, was convicted in what federal prosecutors deemed the most profitable insider trading conspiracy in history. The jury has come back with a verdict, and it is guilty. It is a verdict against 39-year-old Matthew Martoma. He is a former portfolio manager with SAC Capital. In a big Capital. hit to Wall Street corruption, a New York jury has found former SAC portfolio manager Matthew Martoma guilty of insider trading. Although Cohen settled the civil case with regulators in January 2016, agreeing to a ban on managing outside money until 2018, this scandal marked a significant blow to SAC Capital. The firm was forced to close its doors and rebrand as Point 72, transitioning from a hedge fund to a family office. All of the charged SAC companies have agreed to plead guilty. All have agreed to wind down and close their outside investment businesses. And all have agreed collectively to pay total fines and penalties in the record amount of $1.8 billion. Point 72 emerged as Cohen's new venture, emphasizing greater control over investments and cash flow. The family office structure allowed Cohen to manage his own money without the scrutiny of external firms. As the financial landscape evolved, so did Point 72's strategy. Cohen expanded his investments into venture capital and quant strategies, exploring new avenues to generate returns. In 2021, Point 72 faced an unexpected challenge in the form of the GameStop saga. A group of amateur traders from Reddit, fueled by social media, targeted heavily shorted stocks like GameStop, causing a market frenzy. Hedge funds, including Point 72, found themselves on the wrong side of these trades, leading to substantial losses. To navigate this turbulent period, Cohen collaborated with Citadel to inject $2.75 billion to bail out Melvin Capital, another hedge fund hit hard by the GameStop events. The incident highlighted the unpredictability of the financial markets and the impact of social media on stock movements. In recent years, Cohen has continued his pursuit of success. Albeit in a different landscape, Point72 has evolved, allocating funds to other hedge funds, including those started by his former employees. Cohen's investment in Melvin Capital, despite the GameStop setback, reflects his willingness to take risks and explore opportunities. As the financial industry grapples with changing dynamics, Cohen remains a prominent figure, exploring new avenues to maintain his edge. His foray into venture capital and strategic investments indicates a broader vision for Point72 beyond traditional trading. Beyond the challenges faced by SAC Capital Advisors, Cohen's resilience shone through. He diversified his investments into various sectors, reflecting a strategic move beyond the hedge fund industry. 
Cohen's net worth, estimated at $17.4 billion as of April 2022, has enabled him to explore new opportunities and ventures. Cohen's ownership of the New York Mets marked a new chapter for the franchise. In 2012, he became a minority owner, holding an 8% stake. However, his involvement didn't stop there. In 2020, Cohen took a giant leap, purchasing a controlling interest in the team for $2.4 billion, assuming the role of chairman and CEO. This move not only diversified his investment portfolio, but also reflected his commitment to the world of sports. As an avid sports fan, Cohen combined his passion for the game with his business acumen, creating renewed excitement among Mets fans. Under Cohen's leadership, the Mets embarked on a journey to building a winning team and enhance the overall fan experience. His financial resources facilitated significant investments in player acquisitions and infrastructure improvements. The goal was clear, to bring the Mets back to their former glory and clinch a World Series championship. Cohen's real estate ventures are as diversified as his financial investments. From a 14-acre estate in Greenwick, Connecticut, to properties in East Hampton, Beverly Hills, Greenwick Village, and Delray Beach. His real estate portfolio showcases a strategic approach to asset accumulation. Beyond traditional investments, Cohen's extensive art collection is a testament to his appreciation for diverse forms of wealth. Featuring works of arts by renowned artists such as Jackson Pollock, Damien Hirst, and Jeff Koons, the collection is estimated to be valued around $1 billion. It's a vivid example of Cohen's willingness to explore avenues beyond conventional financial instruments. Steve Cohen's journey from a middle-class kid with a passion for poker to one of Wall Street's most successful traders is filled with highs and lows. His story is a testament to the importance of adaptability and ability to evolve in the face of challenges. While Cohen's career has been marred by legal controversies, the lessons from his success and setbacks offer valuable insights. The importance of discipled risk management, emotional detachment and trading, and the need for constant adaption to market changes are central themes in Cohen's journey.